Good morning, and God bless you all. I greet you all in the awesome name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. I'm so excited to be with you all again. Um, before I share the word, uh, I give honor to God who is the head of my life. Without him, I could do nothing. And because of him, I'm able to do everything. Uh, thank you, God. And thank you to our pastor, Reverend Dr. Tawana A. Harris, for giving me the opportunity uh, to be obedient to the call that God has placed on my life, um, allowing me to share his word with his people. Then I just want to take a moment to thank all of you that have tuned in for another episode um, of PowerPoints. Not just today, but there are those of you who have been with us over the past two years. So thank you, thank you, thank you for always being here and sharing in worship with us. Now, I'm happy to tell you that there is a word from God. Amen. You all know how I do it. My intention is never to be before you too long, but I'm ever obedient to the Holy Spirit. How he leads is how I follow. Now, our sermonic text this morning can be found in Colossians 3, uh, verses 12 through 15. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. The word of God reads thus. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. The word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Father God, thank you for another day. Thank you for another opportunity to be used by you. Thank you for allowing me to come before your people with your message. Now, Father God, I just ask that uh, you hide me behind your cross so that the people will only see and hear you. Father God, I also ask for a manifestation of the Holy Spirit to uh, just saturate the atmosphere wherever people are watching this episode of PowerPoints. Father God, please be with them. And now, Father God, I ask you to have your way in me. I humble myself. I submit to your authority over me. Have your way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, our teaching text actually comes from the letter that Paul wrote to um, the Colossians. One, it's one of the prison letters that he wrote during his imprisonment in Rome. Uh, this letter is written in response to um, the Colossian heresy that was going on at the time. And chapter three, verses one through seven is titled in the new NIV as rules for holy living. Now in the RSV, it's titled as the true center of Christian life. And the message translation titles it as Living the New Life. That's the one that I, I really like, Living the New Life. Uh, these titles are important today because they help us to deal with um, a very real and important issue uh, that has been happening since the beginning of the early church. That is church hurt. Now, some of you may be wondering, why is Reverend King bringing up church hurt? Because I believe that we are in a season where we will be inundated with people coming into our churches um, and they're going to want some answers. And I think that we should be able to give them answers. Um, we're going to meet people who want who, who are going to say to us, I've been to church before and all I ever uh, got from church was um, people doing me dirty and, 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 and people being mean. And, and so I just gave up. I quit going to church. But I think we're in a season where God is calling his people back to the church. And so so as a church body, as a church family, we need to know how to deal with church hurt. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, some of you may know exactly what church hurt is. Others have heard of it. And still there are those of you who um, have been the recipients of this particular kind of pain. I read several definitions for what church hurt can be. 
Allow me to just summarize. It is a physical and mental mistreatment of people or persons based on human expectations. Sometimes it's an abuse of power. Now that can be either by the pastor, the church leadership, the church congregation, or just individual. The thing is church hurt oppresses. It intimidates and it dominates. And more than that, it simply hurts people. The most devastating thing that church hurt causes is that the sufferers distance themselves not just from the church and and their community, who help us, Jesus, but they also will distance themselves from God. Often they associate the pain and the hurt with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. They wonder why would he let that happen in his church? Because see, his church is supposed to be a place of healing and help. His church is supposed to be the place of redemption, a place to uplift, empower, and enlighten. His church is supposed to be a place where you find love. I dare not try to answer the question of why or how today, but what I can offer you is a way to heal from the hurt, a way to help others from the hurt. And because the truth of the matter is that church hurt can occur more than once in your lifetime. So first, you have to know your enemy. There are some people who don't, they don't want us to talk about Satan. They don't want us to talk about the devil. But if we do this, if we don't talk about him, we forget what scripture warns us of and and how Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Hmm. Sometimes we are devoured by our own annoyances with one another and with the church. Sometimes we're 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 bothered by um the way a person may speak to us in the morning or or the way that um ideas were expressed in a meeting. So when conflict with another believer happens, we need to ask ourselves a very important question. Am I wrestling against flesh and blood? The answer is usually yes. Then as Christians, we must remember that our sole opponent is in the spiritual realm. Scripture tells us to be alert and to resist the enemy, to be on guard and to stand against the schemes of the devil. So when irritation strikes, recognize your true opponent. Know that he has schemes and plans in place that will at best steal from you and at worst destroy God's people and their effectiveness. The next thing you're going to need to do is pray, saints of God. When we are hurt by the church, We should always go to the source of love. God himself is great at not hurting us, even though people have hurt us. The first thing we should do is go to the one who will never hurt us or abandon us. Spend time with God, just resting in his love. And do what Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Amen. This next step can be hard but it needs to happen. You're going to have to confront the offender or the offenders. Now, this is not always easy, but it is necessary. I don't care if it's a bishop. I don't care if it's a presiding elder, a pastor, church uh, uh, leadership. It does not matter. When somebody has hurt you, the best course of action is to confront the the offender. Now, I'm not saying get ready to fight. I'm not saying that. But as Christians, we should be able to speak to each other and talk to each other about what has happened. And I know this is not easy, but it's necessary. We don't like confrontation. A wise man once told me, very wise man, The only thing worse than confronting the person is what could happen if we don't deal with that confrontation. We need to address the issue head on. Jesus knows best, so let's follow his way in doing this. 
In Matthew 18, 15, Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between, now hear me, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Often hurt can be resolved just by confronting the person who has hurt you. Just by saying, hey, what you said hurt. And I don't believe that you meant it, but it did hurt just the same. Because sometimes, sometimes they might not even know that they have hurt you. After the confrontation, your next step is to forgive. I know that this is not always easy. Listen, I have never met a Christian, including myself, who did not or does not struggle with forgiveness. Something that you have to work at every day. If you wake up on Monday and you're able to forgive the person that wronged you, then that's wonderful. However, what happens when you wake up on Tuesday? The pain hits you and you find yourself struggling once again. Then focus. Focus on forgiving that person again. Do it every day until the struggle ceases. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Nevertheless, the truth is that forgiveness is not optional for us. It's not optional because we belong to God. Our text today tells us in verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I understand that, that this is difficult to hear, but remember all the wrong that you have caused against God and remember that you have been forgiven. I read this phrase once and it made the process of forgiving just a little bit easier for me. Forgiven people forgive. Let me say that one more time. Forgiven people forgive. And now one more time for the Holy Spirit. Forgiven people forgive. Isn't that wonderful? So you have done the steps, but nothing is resolved. So what should you do? I'm glad you asked me that. You should find you a faithful friend or partner. It helps to have someone you trust that you um, can confide in. Talk with them privately about your pain and your problem. Once that is done, take them with you to resolve the issue. Matthew 18 and 16, Jesus says to us, but if they, the offender, will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of, of two or three witnesses. A faithful partner can help you deal with the issue. After that, your next thing to move on to is resolving your own past. Yeah, you got to take a look at yourself. All of us, every single one of us, is guilty of hurting our brothers and our sisters at some time in our lives. Jesus says in his word, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Maybe you didn't mean to do it. Maybe you just weren't even aware that it would bother them. Maybe you didn't think what you said to the people who were coming to visit would change how they felt about the church, but it did. Maybe you didn't realize your actions were hurtful. Maybe you didn't mean to, to, to act in a hurtful way, but sometimes it just happens. You still, you still inflicted pain upon someone. Go, go quickly, go and apologize. Humble yourself and ask for their forgiveness. Once you've done that, then you need to commit to act in love. That's right. I said it, church. We all need to commit to act in love. We get so busy doing church sometimes that we forget why we're here. We're not just here to worship God. That's a very big part of it. But we're also here to love on each other. So again, I say to each and every one of you today, 
before you start watching this uh, particular episode of PowerPoints, commit to act in love. Verse 14 of our text tells us, and over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This reminds us that when you put on love, you put on compassion, you put on kindness, you put on humility, you put on gentleness and patience. Then you can walk in the kind of love that God meant us to have for one another. It can heal the church hurt. And my personal belief is that it can prevent the church hurt. So church, commit to act in love. Commit to act in love. I can't stress it enough. If we could just love on each other more, it would be wonderful. In closing, I want you to know that church hurt can be overcome. And I pray that if you or a loved one encounters it, the process of healing is a very real thing. That you don't have to leave the church. You don't have to stay away from your friends at the church. You don't have to distance yourself from God because his word and his presence can bind wounds and heal the brokenhearted. So remember your steps. Know your enemy. Know who you're really angry with. Pray, 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 pray. Then confront the offender. After you've confronted your offender, forgive the offender. If you're having trouble with that, find a faithful friend that can help you with this. Somebody you can really confide in and talk to. Then take a look at your own past. And remember that those that are forgiven, forgive. And remember this. This is it. Commit to act in love. Make that a part of your daily life every day. Get up and say, today I'm going to act in love. No matter the circumstances. Because the devil is a lie. As soon as you verbalize it, he's going he's gonna to try to trip you up. He's going to try to put a stumbling block in your way. But don't you give up. You tell yourself throughout the day that I am going to commit to act in love. I'm going to love on my brothers and sisters. I'm going to love on God's people. I am not going to be the reason that somebody decides that they don't want to come to church anymore, that they, they don't want to be in relationship with Jesus, that, that they don't want to know God or have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Commit to act in love. That is my prayer for you today. God bless you. God keep you. Amen. Allow me to pronounce the benediction in this way. Please hear me when I say it is my prayer to God that the Lord bless you and keep you, that the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>